Hi, everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Welcome to Beatles News Briefs, your home for the best news and views from the Beatle world. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci. Today we'll have an interview with Glenn Burtnick of The Weaklings and Tony Palagrosi about a new double album by Glenn with a little help from some friends that pays tribute to the 50th anniversary of Woodstock. And we'll also have a little Weaklings news. And contributing editor uh, Candy Leonard and myself will have a very, underline that word, very, lively discussion on whether the Beatles were really a boy band or not. But first, here's some Beatle news. Paul McCartney is back on the road. He began the U.S. stretch of his Freshen Up tour May 23rd at Smoothie King Center in New Orleans. A local website, nolo.com, headlined its review, Paul McCartney Amazes at Smoothie King Center. Here's the opening from its review by writer Doug McCash. Quote, if I reach the, reach the age of 76, I hope I still have the stamina to attend a three-hour rock concert never mind performing a demanding three-hour show like Paul McCartney did at the Smoothie King Center on Thursday night. The review was your pretty standard review, with McCash picking out a few musical highlights, with uh, Let Me Roll It being his favorite. On previous shows in the tour, Paul's been playing tracks from Egypt Station, Come On To Me, Who Cares, Back In Brazil, For You, as well. I, along with others, keep hoping for Uncle Albert and Ad- Admiral Halsey, but no luck with that yet. In chart news, the two Beatles albums on the latest Billboard 200 dated June 8th both made big jumps up. The Beatles one is now at 98 from 144 the previous week, and Abbey Road is at 105 up from 154. And on the latest UK official charts top 100 album chart dated May 31st, the Beatles one sits at number 74 this week, which is where it was last week. On May 31st, Gem Records released Glenn Burtnick's Summer of Love concert, Live Love. The 18th song, two-CD set, is a tribute to the 50th anniversary of Woodstock and is available as both a download and a stream. The CDs include music from artists including The Beatles, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Janis Joplin, The Doors, Crosby, Stills & Nash, Jefferson Airplane, The Turtles, The Mamas and Papas, Lulu, Procol Harum, Joe, Joe Cocker, Melanie, Ike and Tina Turner, Otis Redding, and Sly and the Family Stone, performed by Glenn and a group of very talented performers. We recently talked with Glenn, who you know is, like we said, is a member of the Weaklings, and Tony Palagrosi, who were co-creators of the project. Um, Glenn also reveals some big Weaklings news. Here's our interview. We're here to talk about the the Summer of Love concert. Is that correct, Glenn? That's yeah. correct. Okay. Okay. Also, there's an album coming out. Um, right. That yeah, it's kind of yeah. as much about that as uh, as the yeah. shows, but the shows are very, yeah. So very we're talking important. we're it's talking about important. the live shows and the and the album. Because, and, the, and the live album that's coming out. Right. Yes. Yeah. I have I have that in front of me. In fact, I was listening. Or I have the, that information, and I was listening to it before I called you, and um, and then um, uh, I saw the schedule of the the, the uh, live concerts at the at the end. Um, the live concerts. Um, I probably shouldn't ask this question now, but the live concerts are mostly in the on the East Coast. Is that correct for now? Yeah. Yes. Will there be any? Mostly. Will there be any? Well, I mean, Go ahead. I mean, at this point, yes, but we've played the Midwest. Before. Okay. Well, we're we're also uh, going to um, Nashville, right? And Cleveland Heights. Yeah, and and we're going to uh, 2020. We're going to Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so we're we're creeping out there. Creeping out there. <laughs> okay. So how 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 did this get started? How how long? What, what brought this about? <sighs> um. Well. Uh, Tony and I are the same age, and uh, as are some other members of our uh, cast. Mm-hmm. Our, our, you know, our music director, uh, Vinny Daniele, also. But I grew up with this music. I uh, it's really the 
inspiration for my for everything that I've done. <laughs> um, you know, I became a songwriter and I've worked. Uh, I, I became a full time musician as soon as I got out of high school, and uh, I haven't looked back. And really, I owe it all to my love for this era in popular music that happened while I was growing up, while I went through my throughout my boyhood. And, you know, so, so always in the back of my mind, I, I always wanted to, you know, revisit, be a part of, you know, by the time I got, I was really making albums and writing songs and all of that, mm -hmm. it, 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 that time had passed and we were moving on and that's fine. But in the back of my heart, always uh, the music of the Woodstock generation. Tony, you so, feel, you so. feel the same way, Tony? Well, of course. I mean, I you know I uh, had the opportunity, much to the horror of my mother, <laughs> of, of going to Woodstock. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, you know, of course, when Governor Rockefeller declared an emergency situation and threatened to bring in twenty thousand National Guard troops, <laughs> my mother had heart failure. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, and there were no cell phones and, and all of that. But, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I'm I'm a, music, a musician as well. And uh, I was very steeped in rock and roll as a kid. I mean, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a Rolling Stones fan early on. And, um, and a trumpet player who, who liked rhythm and blues. And so I, my heroes really were people like Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and Arthur Alexander and Muddy Waters and and you know I, I was kind of turned on to that stuff as a as a kid and uh, you know the '60s music to me has been I think some of the best pop rock uh, writing that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of a, a combination of uh, you know some of the you know the writers on uh, to some uh, level were steeped. In the more complex songwriting of the Great American Songbook, they kind of had that in their heads. They had the blues in their heads. They had obviously rock in their heads. So it was a great, I think, uh, coming together of, uh, of a lot of different um, resources and inspirations. And and then the writing, uh, I think, really, uh, really uh, tip of, uh, shows that. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in, in bands like the Beatles, I mean, you know, they were listening to, to Tin Pan Alley stuff in in, in, in Britain, and uh, you know, a lot of their great chord progressions come from that kind of great American songbook type of writing. Right. But and and, and in, in any event, you know, obviously, you know, the the politics were so, was was something that I keyed into. Uh, the uh, the fashion interested me. Um, you know, of course, you know, beautiful hippie girls <laughs> being a yeah. part of that uh, interested me. And basically, I mean, Glenn and I kind of put this together when um, uh, a, a guy who was the executive director of the Count Basie Theater Foundation uh, asked us to put uh, kind of a, a big cash show together for a benefit concert for the Count Basie Theater. Yeah. And then that was kind of the impetus for Glenn and I to come up with this idea. And then we researched it and looked at, uh, you know, who played all of the festivals in, in 19, you know, between 1967 and 1969 and what they were playing and, and all of that. And we kind of uh, pieced it together from that research mm -hmm. and developed the Summer of Love from, from that point on. Um, before I forget, I want to ask... Uh, Tony, uh, what's your single uh, biggest memory of Woodstock? Well, actually, the girl that I that let me sleep in her sleeping bag with her. <laughs> she, was, she was about 27 or 28 years old, and I was 14 going on 15, or 15 yeah. going on 16. Oh, my. Excellent. So that was my <laughs> overriding memory. <laughs> 
I should have I, I, sh- I should have told you this is possibly going to be for a podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say anything on. Uh, no, that's true. Obscene. No, you didn't. <laughs> I'm just telling you now. And I'm not promoting <laughs> drug use either. Okay. Okay. So so. It it came out of this whole project came out of a, a benefit for the the Count Basie Center. Um, how long did it take you to put this thing together, and what did, where did you what did you do to to put it together? It, you know, it probably took uh, maybe two to three months, and um, I uh, we we reached out to all our talented friends that we thought would suit this music uh little did we know that this would become you know more than an annual thing more than a one-time thing it, it but the reaction was so strong um that uh the, the count basie almost instantly wanted us back a year later and so that kind of got the machine rolling where it's like well let's Let's uh, you know tighten up uh, any of the loose screws and and, uh, and see uh, if it's roadworthy and and it all culminated in here it was eight years later. Um, Tony brought in recording equipment and said let's record this show. So our eighth year, I think it was at the Count Basic Theater, was recorded and Tony produced uh, a live album. He mixed it all down and um, you know. And I have to say, it's the first double album I've ever been involved with. So I'm, so that's kind of a retro uh, feather in my cap as well, you know. Okay. Um, on the uh, well, over the eight years and including the album, is there anybody that performed at Woodstock that's been involved? No. No. Yeah. No. 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 They're all pretty old. We did. <clears throat> I got, I got close to getting Richie Havens there, huh. and um, and Melanie is still a possibility. But uh, you know, we have we do have a young cast. Okay. And and in a lot of ways, that represents that era, right? As much as anything, you know. And the and the vocals sound very, very <laughs> like they were from that era. So that. That you know that uh, uh, works in that regard. Um, whereas you know, if you had you know a bunch of older people, they wouldn't. It wouldn't necessarily sound um, that authentic. But it, they the vocals do sound that, that authentic. Um, well, that's nice to hear. Well, yeah. thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was I, mean, I was listening to, and and you know you definitely get you know feelings of of um, mamas and papas and and you know and. I don't have the, the track list in front of me. I did. Uh, I had it on my other computer. But yeah, it, it, there's definitely some some authentic vocals there, and it it sounds really nice. Um, so this was recorded this year. This is the eighth year. Well, of the, it, was, it was recorded in 2018. Oh, okay, okay. And and that was the that was the eighth year of the show. Is that what you said? Or, yeah. Okay. So this has been going on for a while. It's no, this is nothing new. It's uh, no, no. Okay. Um, it's been growing and growing, but but it's been selling out in the last few years, and uh, and everywhere we take it. Uh, in fact, to be honest, I'm surprised when we go to a market that we've never been in before that hasn't heard of Glenn Burtnick necessarily or something, right. and we show up and there's this this fabulous large house full of people um i think that just the title alone gets the point across and if you look at the promotional materials and the poster and stuff it's just um people get it and then they're happily surprised when when they show up because it really is like a love fest hmm. okay well you know one of the one of the things that we realized early on um and I think our audiences um, certainly helped us to realize this, was that most, if not all, of these folks who come to see this show, including us, who are old enough to have been going to concerts in that time period, mm-hmm. uh, 
no one has ever seen all of these artists live on stage playing these songs. Right. Right. And this is this is the, un the the truly amazing thing about the show is that finally they get to hear these songs played authentically, live and in person. And you also you know, with 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 contemporary uh, kind of uh, technology, and that was one of the reasons that I wanted to to make this record, mm -hmm. uh, just to, to kind of literally record this almost as a as a historic fact. You know, um, to to memorialize the show, and and to actually to elicit the kind of response that you just gave in terms of the authenticity of the show. Mm -hmm. That's because I, you know, I'm standing out in the house listening to it every night we play, and I'm always struck by how authentic our cast re reproduces these songs. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, you know, and, and as Glenn said, you know, some of our cast is very young. Right. And yet, you know, we managed to find uh, the folks that, in the, you know, that had this affinity for this music in their hearts and in their souls. And, and you hear it, and uh, it's so nice to hear you say that you hear it when you listen to the CD, because that was one of the reasons I did it in the first place, mm -hmm. was to capture that, you know? And you also have, and, a, you uh, also have a light show with the live show, correct? Yes. So there's another there's another thing that um, that people won't necessarily younger people especially won't necessarily understand until they see it. But it's something that that we who you know uh, and I'm I think I'm I think I'm in your age bracket, guys. Um, we who attend you're concert, that young. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I might actually be older than both of you, but that's. Um, you know <clears throat> about the light show. Excuse me. Uh, the sure. <clears throat> he, <clears throat> we have a guy who had a business back in the. I, I guess he started in the late '60s. Yeah. Called Pig Light Show. Mark Rubenstein's Pig Light Show. And not, he, that does sound familiar. Uh, I, I. Oh yeah. I think it was. I think that was more of an East Coast thing than out here, because they had yeah. out here they had uh, Joshua Light. Playing, well, doing well, the well, film more all the well, time. Well, Joshua was in New York as well. Oh, was he in but New York? Joshua, okay. Yeah, he was at the Fillmore East in New York. Okay. But Joshua brought Pig in. Pig was yeah. young, is, was younger than Josh. Okay. Uh, Mark Rubenstein was only seventeen years old when Joshua brought him into the Fillmore mm. in New York because Joshua was do, was starting to do more and more, mm -hmm. uh, more venues, uh, festivals outside concerts he was going to the west coast right so that's how pig got involved but the reality was and 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 pig uh mark rubenstein didn't know this until literally a year or two ago when he was speaking to joshua because they've, they've remained, uh, remained friends all of these years um joshua told him that he was actually doing this kind of light show before joshua did it um jo Joshua just got high, you know, Bill Graham found out about Joshua before he found out about Pig and brought Joshua in, but Pig had actually been doing it earlier. And, uh, and Mark has a great story of, uh, how Frank Zappa gave him the name of Pig. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the story? Um, well, I don't know if I'd, uh, Tell do it justice. Do it justice? Okay. Yeah. Okay. But he actually, to think about it, though, um, <clears throat> Mark, you know, Pig Light Show is uh, the most authentic element of the show because this is a guy that he did lights for the Jefferson Airplane and, you know, Blue Cheer and Jimi Hendrix and all of this stuff from that era. Yeah. Um, right. You know, and, and uh, so he is he's an authentic guy. Um, are you going to, speaking of the light show, are you going to... Uh, is this going to be available on video at some point, or right now it's going to be only audio right now? Is that it? Yeah, it's just audio right now. Okay. okay. You know, the, the video thing is a whole other can of worms. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this will be out on, on the 31st, and it'll be available through um, iTunes. Um, is it going to be hard CD or just digital? Oh, it's hard as well. Okay. 
So, yeah. so it'll be available on Amazon and and anywhere anywhere else. Do you have a website, uh, a direct uh, website to to put it through? Or are you or is it going to be on Facebook? <clears throat> no, it'll be on summeroflockconcert.com. dot com. We we we'll we'll have it in our merch. Okay. Uh, or online merch. Who are some sure. of the who are some of the performers? Would people know some of the performers uh, involved besides you, Glenn? Um. Yeah, well, there, you know, it's a full cast. Um, <clears throat> there's a girl, Reagan Richards, who has a, a, a band called Williams Honor, who are doing very well in country music these days. And um, there's a guy named Freedom Bremner, who's uh, uh, he, he was in uh, Screaming Headless Torsos until they broke up recently. There's a guy named Remember Jones, who's uh, creating a stir with his live show. Um, Emily Grove. There's there, There's a lot of young talent um that are uh, starting to really build a uh, an important uh, audience and uh, we're happy to have them okay um i i, I was going to say I, I remember jones gets quite an introduction in the on the cd there before he starts doing uh, i think it was with, with a little help from my friends um but um yeah uh, um, is um, if I can change the subject slightly, uh, Glenn, is uh, do the uh, Weaklings have any plans uh, coming up? Sure, we do. We're we're crazy busy. Uh, crazy this, busy. Yeah, and we have a full schedule coming up this summer as well. It's a very. I've gotten myself into trouble here with all these, uh, you know, these these bands and these acts that are getting sought after you know it's, it's i mean not in good trouble the good kind of trouble good kind of trouble uh, I'm, yeah i'm busy as can be um is there an album see, is there a, a recording coming from the weaklings uh, soon well we have two albums out but yes we are working on our third album and it will probably be released uh before the end of the year and um most of the album was recorded in Abbey Road Studios in London. Oh, another another Abbey Road album. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Did you go back there, or was this recorded when you did the last one? No, we were thinking ahead, and we recorded uh, two albums worth of material. While we good, wrote. good for you. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> and, and there's also another single coming out. Ooh. That's right. Oh, yeah. Okay. You wanna? Yeah. Do you wanna reveal any more details or? Say a time. Well, yeah, you know. Well, for, first of all, I should tell you that our present single is uh, "Friday on My Mind," a cover right. of uh, the Easy Beats, but uh, featuring Peter Noon did a, a guest appearance on our record, so he's singing, her, you know, Herman from Herman's Herm right. Hermits. And um, but nevertheless, our our next single is called "I Want You Again," and we have a smoking video that's coming out with it, and it'll be out. June fourteenth. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Tony. Um, good luck with the uh, good luck with the uh, album. And um, um, I'm looking, and I'm sure uh, I, I know it will do well, having heard it. Um, and uh, and also look forward to the Weaklings. Thank you, gentlemen. That's great. Right. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. And also this week. Can, contributing editor Candy Leonard, author of Beatles, and myself discussed, I guess debated is a better word, the idea that the Beatles were some kind of boy band. How do you feel about that? Here's how we feel about it. Listen to our discussion. I'm here with the esteemed contributing editor of this podcast, Candy Leonard, author of the esteemed book, Beatleness. How are you, Candy? Good, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. And we're going to talk about a recurring topic that comes up every so often. And it, it go, it, it's been debated so many times. Um, but I thought that we would take a look at it using Candy's perspective as a sociologist um, and both of our perspectives as fans as to whether the Beatles were actually a boy band. Um, I know Billboard did a did a little debate on it uh, last year, um, 
kind of looking at it from both sides and going through a number of different bands, but we're going to, and, and other people have written about it and talked about it, but we're going to talk about it from our perspectives and, um, and I'm going to, Candy, I'm going to let you start because I know you've got a lot to say about this. So, <laughs> so go, go for it. Thank you. It's actually, as I was listening to your intro, I actually realized there's sort of two different questions almost. There's were the Beatles a boy band, i.e. in the day? Mm-hmm. And then the other question is, are the Beatles a boy band? In other words, is it okay to talk? In other words, is, is it appropriate or historically correct to refer to them today as a boy band? It's just two slightly different issues. However, from my perspective, the answer is no in both cases. Um, I think it is absolutely historically, sociologically, pop culturally, commonsensically incorrect <laughs> to refer to the Beatles as a boy band. And if you want, I can go through this just like it's a very simple sort of almost checklist of like what is a boy band and do those characteristics apply to the Beatles? So um, can I do that? Well, well, let me let me say for uh, you okay. said you said that you don't think of them as a boy band. In, in other words, I assume you're saying ever, right? Ever, ever. Okay. Ever. Okay. Ever. I want to make I want to make that clear. Go ahead. Right. Well, as I as I said before, I mean, listening to your intro made me realize that in fact these are two different questions. But I think the answer to, to both is no for slightly different reasons. But um, let me go through. Uh, my thinking on this. Okay. Go ahead. So, what is what is a boy band? What makes for a boy band? And just some context, which is kind of a, <laughs> crucial here, is that you know boy bands emerged in the early '90s. You know, in sync, Backstreet Boys. You know that type of thing. And I think that part of the rise of the boy band was you know the result of the you know MTV. I think made music in general more visual and boy bands were you know part of that whole thing but okay so we think about and then of course more recent ones you know one dimension uh one direction five seconds of summer uh and of course the one that people are talking about a lot now is bts part of the k-pop um um uh, genre and the uh and bts of course were famously introduced on colbert recently Mm -hmm with a lovely homage to the theater where Colbert does his show, which of course is where the Beatles appeared on stage with Ed Sullivan. Um, Colbert did not refer to BTS as a boy band, however, uh, t- excuse me, to the Beatles as a boy band. And I think Colbert wouldn't because he just wouldn't. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit. Here are the things. Okay. A young male vocal group. Okay, yes, the Beatles were, you could say, were a young male vocal group, but, you know, they were not only a vocal group. Okay. Created by a manager or a record label as a commercial venture. Okay, synthetic. They did not come together organically. This is probably the most important, this is sort of the, the, the synchronon definition. Okay, created by a manager or a record label as a commercial venture. They're, they did not come together organically. Okay, so it auditioned young men with a certain look to appeal to young women. Um, here is a, another very important um, quality that clearly puts the you know sh- you know puts the Beatles in a whole other category. Mm-hmm. Boy bands don't play their own instruments in recording sessions or on stage, and they don't write their own songs. Okay. So boy bands were manufactured, they auditioned young men with a certain look, which we'll get to the monkeys in a minute, um, (laughs) auditioned young men with a certain look uh, for the purpose of a commercial venture to be marketed to young women. Okay, this is another one of the criteria, sing love songs marketed to young women. And you can say, yeah, the Beatles checked that box too. But if you look at all these qualities, and the other thing is highly choreographed, okay? Boy bands are about choreography. Now, um, which, you know, if you think about the Motown, you know, you can look at the Motown, uh, you know, The Temptations, Four Tops, Jackson Five. We can apply this uh, rubric to all these bands, but let's just think about the Beatles right now. Okay, so young male vocal group, yes. 
created by magic, commercial venture, synthetic, obviously not. You, I mean, the whole beauty of the Beatles story is their organic beginning. They, how they came together, how they found each other. Um, obviously, they honed their craft, songwriting, musicianship. Uh, yeah, they had choreography, but it was that if you watch, I, I talk about this in Beelness, I refer to their natural choreography, part of their uh, look on the Ed Sullivan show, and they, you know, that, that whole performance so spectacular, was the way they moved. They each had a signature move, which they still, Paul still does to this day, right? And mm -hmm. the best of the tribute bands, shout out to Studio Two, um, capture those moves beautifully. Um, so yeah, you know, Paul, they, each of them have their, their personal move and together it's like this Beatle choreography. But that's a way different thing than, you know, what we're, when we think about the choreography of boy bands, obviously. So, I mean, so on that one, I'm sort of, that aspect, I'm sort of being a little bit facetious in that, yeah, they even had that, but it was organic. You know what I mean? It was who they were. Um, all right, so, so if you look at it very superficially, you know, back in the day, you say, oh, they were marketed to young women, you know, um, and and they were young, you know, they were on the most superficial of level. You can say, oh, well, they were kind of like a boy, but they're not. The whole concept was different. These were four friends <clears throat> with a passion for music and a drive to perfect their craft who came together, who found each other through. I mean, we all know the story musical chairs of the Beatles coming together, all the angels around them who helped like Bill Harry and Brian Epstein, whatever. The, but it, it all came together. And so did it eventually become a commercial venture? Well, kind of, yeah. But, you know, they needed a manager. Of course, they wanted to make money. But it was not like some impresario who said, let's find some guys and make some money, you know. So, to, and so why, does the, why do I feel so strongly about this? Because I feel like in the passage of time and just, you know, just kind of the, the sort of the saturated uh, uh, pop culture journalism around the Beatles is so much all the time and people coming in and opining from different vantage points. And I, I just feel like for, for the sake of history and what boy bands mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a um, derogatory term, and this actually gets back to another, to one of the characteristics, which is the uh, being marketed to women. I, uh, somebody um, who used, who referred to the Beatles as a boy band, which kind of surprised me. I asked him, well, if that's, the, or that they were a boy band, rather, in, you know, when they came on the scene, I said, okay, well, when did they stop being a boy band? And the conventional answer to that by people who say, oh, yeah, you can call them a boy band, was when they it became apparent that they were artists and not just pretty faces marketed to girls. But first of all, that was apparent all along because of what I was talking about before, the artistry, the skill. They were obviously more than pretty faces from the get-go. Now, the fact that they were marketed to young women exclusively, first of all, that's not entirely true. But certainly, Beatlemania was a uh, female event. And I think that to call them a boy band during the Beatlemania era and then say, well, by the time of like late help, they started to, you know, there's a kind of diminishing of the female fan in that, that, I mean, carries through to a lot of Beatle commentary, but, you know, it, it sort of implies that, um, you know, the female fan is a unsophisticated listener and when, and this is also, consistent with the view that when the Beatles started evolving, they lost a lot of their quote-unquote teeny bopper fans. And so, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that one can unpack. But the point is the Beatles were not a boy band in the day. They should not be called a boy band now. And uh, it, it really, it, it's a disservice to them. It, it, it takes away from their specialness, I think, to uh, refer to them in that way. Okay. Um, let's see, how do I, how do I say this? Um, I think I look at it from a different, with different elements than you do. Okay. And, and I, I, 
I think I, I, I pretty much, I, I disagree on, on several points. Number one, that they were never a boy band. Um, they may not have meant to be a boy band. They weren't according to your definition because they weren't artificial. But there were several elements there that were there, um, given the the parallels between, you know, one dimension, the monkey. You mentioned the monkeys. The monkeys. Well, the in. monkeys are a special case because they were, by the definition I propose, they were absolutely a boy band. But then they evolved into a real band. They right. became like Pinocchio. They became a real boy. Like they they became a real band. Right, and the same thing, and and the the Beatles never started out as a boy band. Let's make that clear, okay? Yes. They started out as as a rock and roll band. They were that's what they were there, that's what they meant to be in the beginning. Right, and they found each other. And they found each other, but there was a time when, especially in the you know as Capital was more and and EMI were, were marketing them. And and uh, Beatlemania was starting to click. That they did. They were they were very much marketed as a boy band. There was the John Paul George and Ringo personality thing. That I remember. There was a um, when I was when I was a ch um, uh, I think about ten years old um, when I delivered papers for a short time uh, for those of you in the Boston area. I believe it was the Herald American. And in, and at one point, right at the beginning of Beatlemania, the, the, the paper ran a four-part series um, on each of the Beatles per day. And, mm -hmm. you know, it had all their statistics, where they were born, how tall they were, right. you know, eyes, hair, right. the whole thing. That is definitely a boy band thing, and it, well, it, it yeah. wait, 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 and it okay. didn't only it didn't only stop there. It it I mean if if you looked at many of the books that came out at that time, there were many as sixteen magazine, uh, Tiger Beat. They all you know they they both they they weren't looking as the, at the Beatles as as musicians. They were looking at them as a boy band. Who's and that? Who's the they that you're talking about? Management? No, no, no. Talking about team what magazines. The world? I mean, fan, who are you? fan magazines. Fan magazines were marketing them as, right. you know, as as right. boy bands. Gl I, okay. Gl Gloria Stavers did a right. did did yes. a. I think that I mean you're absolutely right that they were marketed. Let's let's put the term boy band aside for a moment. All they right. were marketed as. Uh, you know, to teenage girls, no question about it. They were pinups. Right. They were heartthrobs. What's their favorite food? What's their favorite color? Uh, win a date with Paul. Yes, I, I'm not disputing. Of course, I mean, and that was a big part of it. But there are a couple and a couple of things to say about that. This is not to say that boy, that there were no male fans because there were. Right. And it's also. Um, there would they wouldn't have been a thing to market had they not first come together as musicians and artists. So when you say they were marketed as a boy band, well, yeah, you could say that uh, in the sense that they were marketed. There was a push towards teenage girls and and the and the whole heartthrob thing, but the concept of boy band should I, I don't think that let's bring the, the term back into it now the, to say that they were marketed as a boy band i don't think that term should be used i mean I, I i guess my whole big issue with this is that the term itself is very uh, a, a, of a certain cultural moment, that being the 90s, okay? So to say the Beatles were marketed as a boy band, I mean, yes, you could break that down and say they were marketed in some ways in the way that one would market to teenage girls. I, I suppose you could say that. But but the concept of boy band itself really it, it didn't exist then. I mean, look, think about how Elvis was marketed or, or even back to Frank Sinatra. I mean, there was a history of... Um, marketing these 
performers, artists, uh, t to young women. And, you know, that's where the whole, see, this is where it gets back to the, the notion, of, you know, that the whole concept of boy band is, is a derogatory term. I don't think people, I mean, most people who are discussing this would not dispute that, that it is a derogatory term. Why is it a derogatory term? Well, because things, you know, um, entertainers that are marketed to girls, you know, that it's kind of like, because girls are non-discriminating consumers of pop music. So I just don't think that the term boy band should be used in, in any conversation about the Beatles at all, because it's, it's anachronistic, you know, it, it, it's a concept and a thing that didn't exist. So I think it muddies the waters to use it in relation to them. I think you're being maybe a little too sensitive about that, but I can under I understand what you what you're saying, that the definition of, of say one one direction is different than the Beatles because we're talking two different eras, two different. You know, there there's a whole bunch of different things. The marketing of a of a group though as a team for you know, commercially for teenage girls is not something new. I mean, no. music music acts have been marketed that way since, you know, even earlier than the 50s. I mean, obviously, sure. Elvis, Elvis is one very big example there. But there are, I mean, and you mentioned Sinatra. Sinatra, although I don't know that I wasn't around then, so I don't, I don't remember how they... They, you know, advertised Sinatra, but they didn't. Well, it was apps. Oh, Blue Eyes. I mean, come on. Right. Hard I, well, I don't know when that. I don't know when that started. I mean, Old Blue Eyes may have been a, may have been a later term. Right. But, but Sinatra was absolutely presented as a heartthrob, and there well, were green magazines with pictures of him, and which was interesting too, because you know he was also in, quite androgynous in his way. He was. He was also reacted to as a heartthrob. I have. A couple of albums of his um, 40s radio shows, and you can actually hear girls screaming in the background. Well, when my mother passed away and I was cleaning out her apartment, I found all her Frank Sinatra fangirl things. It was quite fascinating. Really? <laughs> yeah. I really? mean, I knew she was a Sinatra fan, but I found all this like fan stuff. It was really funny. What did they have? She had like a scrapbook and a bunch of pictures and clippings and things. And um, the, the, there's a story in my family that she was supposed to go see him at the Paramount, but that she was pregnant with my brother at the time, so she couldn't go or something. Oh wow! Something like that. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, but yes, I mean these got you know these these male stars, whether it's music or or it's even you know Errol Flynn. I mean you know yes. It, well, that's sort of. I mean, I guess when you get out of music, it changes a bit. But yeah, I mean, there's a history of this. But, you know, I mean, I think that in this, the whole marketing of these, of artists, of everything in pop culture changed anyway after Elvis and the Beatles. So it's really, a, really talking about different universes in a lot of right. ways. Right. Oh, and, and, I, and I understand it. But there was, as you, as you remember, I mean, you know, and as I remember, there was definitely um, uh, an element of, you know, teenage girlsism. If I can use that word, sure. In, in this, I mean, I remember listening to WABC, you know, in '66 mm -hmm. when when the when the Beatles were coming into town and Cousin Brucey and Dan Ingram were were you know commenting on all the all the girls outside the hotel, you know, and you could hear them on the radio, you could hear them screaming, and and so. Right, and part of why, if you remember, the early press coverage was quite dismissive of them, talking about the hair and mocking the girls. I mean, that was part and parcel of that whole thing then, that whole narrative. Right. So, a, hard, a Hard Day's Night was, was very much part of, for that, right. you know, with that, that perspective. I mean, those shots of Paul with the lights, with the shining lights in back of him. Um, and in fact, at the very very beginning of the movie, when he's he's got the newspaper up in front of him, when I saw I saw a Hard Day's Night the second day it was out, I, I didn't go, I didn't get to go the first day, um, but what the kind second of day. Fan are you Steve? Huh? What kind of fan are you Steve? You didn't I, well, 
my my uh, you can blame my my uh my family because uh i had to go on a shopping trip and i had a ticket for the first day and i had to miss it and i was really not happy about that but, it, but the funny thing was on the second day when he takes the newspaper down the audience in the theater is screaming and so I've got all these. It's it was like you know it was like being at the at the Ed Sullivan show, you know. Yeah, yeah no, the, I mean even now it's showings of Beatles films. Too. Yeah, I mean they, they were absolutely. I mean, you know, he, here's my concern about this is that you know when you and I are long gone, and assuming there's still a world and people are still listening to music and watching films and caring about such things. I don't want somebody to stumble upon a hard day, the film A Hard Day's Night in 30 years or 40 years and say, oh, look at that. It was a boy. It's an early boy band. You know what I mean? Or, or like, you know what I'm saying? In other words, I, I want them to remain a thing apart from the boy band thing. Like they're not a boy band. <laughs> I don't know that. You, I don't know that that's a that, that's you know going to happen I, because you get know, a lot of. People who have a people who teach the Beatles. This this is really where I'm like, and again, this started from a Facebook conversation, post a post that somebody who I was frankly surprised used the term. Um, I don't want people who write about the Beatles, teach the Beatles, opine about the Beatles in public to to use that term boy band in relation to them because it's historically inaccurate, and so you get that pat played forward, uh, to, you know, into the future and. It, it diminishes their singularity and their specialness. I think I think in the age of the Internet and um, clickbait and blogs, you're going to find that kind of lazy comparison for a lot of things, not just I'm not just the, not just the Beatles. Best. I'm doing my very best to prevent. What do you say? I, 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 I said not just the Beatles, because a, a, a lot of a lot of times blog writers tend to say things uh, well even internet trolls tend to say things just to say them well yeah i mean okay yeah you know but and and that's a, a that's a class about the beatles don't say they were the first boy band just don't right you know? i mean that's but that's a problem beyond just you know beyond just this discussion about boy bands i mean you know there's all sorts of stuff you can find on the internet that doesn't mean a thing and on twitter you know, I mean, I don't know that you're ever going to get rid of the comparison. The thing is, though, whether it was totally, whether it was a legitimate, you know, whether it's a legitimate statement throughout their history. And it's not. And I agree with you that it's not. And I'm the, you know, I agree that when they started to become artists and even before that, well, yeah, I think even before that, but definitely when they started to to show seriousness as artists that boy band thing dropped off i mean the so john paul that really, a little bit let's look at that again for a moment what does that mean when you say that the boy band thing dropped off what does that mean well when the, when it became really apparent that the music was more important but, and but they, they, that, wait, let me ask you a question would you say at that point they also stopped marketing to women in the way to girls, females, in the way they had been. Are you talking about back then? Or you, back could then? That, you could actually probably make that case. Yeah, that that that. Did, I mean, see, at that point, they didn't. The Beatles, like by the time of Help and, and Rubber Soul, there was you know, the, the marketing didn't matter anymore because there was just like no more marketing to be done in a sense. Do you know what I mean? Um, no, I'm going to disagree with you there because they had they had the Beatles uh, magazine. And that, yeah. But the the Beatlemania was in, was of such a high volume that no, I'm talking I'm talking about the, the the monthly magazine. They had the monthly magazine that had big pictures, uh, gorgeous pictures, pinups. Yes, they continued. So you're saying they continued to do that? Yeah. Oh yes, I think I think you have to, absolutely yeah. have to say that. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. They, they they didn't get away from it. That's true. Un unfortunately. Well, they, well, that, let me ask you this: They didn't get away from being marketed as pinups, but yet. You are saying they were not still a boy band, or how? I mean, what's your? I, I don't know. What do you say? Well, according to uh, uh, if you're looking at it as the in the '90s comparison, mm -hmm. they they didn't take themselves. They didn't look at themselves that way. You know, 
I think I think early on I think the other, at Sullivan show they they kind of did, but I think later on they they you know starting with help, um, they kind of you know turned away. I mean John to help I well, need right, because they got they grew more powerful number one more confident more I mean that's where you see the development and they, they their confidence there's you know they, they kind of start to really take control of their operation and be who they are and they, oh sure you want to pose us looking you know let's face it they loved getting their I mean they, they might have found it tedious at times but they loved the primping they loved you know they liked all that they liked mm-hmm. just they were all into that so they, I think you're right. I mean, that continued in some ways through the end, but it, it didn't, are you saying that it didn't have the same sort of, I don't know, how was it different than the early stuff, I guess? I don't know. They, they, it was less important or, I don't know. It, they kicked it, they, they did kick it to, into the background. I mean, there was still the, the Beatles Monthly, but there was also, there, I mean, they got serious, they got married later on. Um, but there were certain, uh, but on the other hand, however, there were elements that continued. I wouldn't say John did. I wouldn't say George did. I wouldn't say Ringo did, but Paul has. And you said early, I think you said either before we started or, or during early on that he's continued it to this day. And he has yeah. because as recently as, and I haven't seen the the new show, but as recently as the last, I think the last time I saw him, he used to turn around and w- and wiggle. He's the cute the, one for the female fans. Yes, no, he is the one at seventy eight or however. He, how old is he? Seventy eight. He's about to be what? How old? Is he? He's got a birthday coming up now. Huh? Yeah, I don't. I I I, I seventy. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, he's still the cute one. Well, I mean, that's what we've always, that's what the media, and, and I'm terming myself as part of that, as it has always called him. And he, and he still rivals in that. And it's funny that now, I mean, up until last year, he didn't, he, he would not show his gray hair. Now all of a sudden. Oh, I'm so glad he did gray that. hair Gray hair is cool. So we should save this kind of topic, umbrella topic of like Beatles and aging might be an interesting thing. We should save that for another show. I, I'm, I'm proposing on air. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, okay. Anyway, so, so where do we stand with this? Like, I don't know. I just feel like. We need to. We need to. Um... Well, I, th- I think there's an easy way you can you can you can do it, and I think this will. I would think this will agree. You'll find agreement with this, is that if you can, it, it, anyone that directly compares the Beatles with Boys to Men, No Direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, oh, yeah. is is totally wrong, because they are not. They are not. They are not the same. It's incorrect. It's it, in other words, it, it's incorrect on so many levels, and it's it, it's like calling a bagel a donut. I mean, it, it, well, I, that's not even a good example because no, one, it's could, not. <laughs> one could imagine some hybrid. It, it's just it's just wrong. It's like it's not what they were. There was no such thing as a boy band in 1964. There was no such thing. Like the whole. The whole concept of boy band grew out of, you know, post MTV, neoliberalism, visual culture. I mean, like, whatever. It it didn't exist then, you know. Right. So, anyway. And I and I I will I will agree with you completely on that because again, getting back to the you know the the elements of the Beatles. I mean, the Beatles were musicians, flat out. Exactly. Musicians from the very beginning. Exactly. And this is why I say it diminishes them because part of the, the, you know, a big part of their wow is how did these four guys come about? How did this happen? And all the serendipity around them and in their story and, and the amazingness of it all. To then zoom out and refer to them as a boy band is just like so wrong. We, yeah, because <laughs> you, you because reasons. People, people tend to. Do, to look at that and and just take it as something that isn't. Uh, I mean, it, it ignores, especially if you look at Lewis, and it ignores, you know, the the ups and downs, the, the total seriousness. And I'm not saying that some of these other acts haven't had ups and downs too, but 
in the Beatles case, there were, you know, there was an extremely incredible history. Uh, and the I, and you meant we mentioned the monkeys. I mean, I think that's yeah. something that we need to, you know, that needs to be mentioned here because I don't want to uh, don't want to lop the monkeys into the one dimension boy band. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But here's, you know, what, what, I think it was that Billboard article that raised the point, you know, something like the Beatles are either like should never be called a boy band or they're like the er first ever boy band. I obviously my position is that it's the former and not the latter. But the thing with the monkeys is that one could make a case that the monkeys were the first boy band who then evolved into a real band. <laughs> I, I, and I think that's probably without thinking of another group, uh, or, you know, earlier than that, um, you're probably, you're probably right about that I, because I think about the ads they ran, you know, it, it was really like, okay, how, I mean, the, I mean, the irony is that the thing they were trying, in other words, it was like put together as a commercial venture. Why did they think it would be a commercial venture? Well, obviously because of the Beatles, but that doesn't make the Beatles a boy band. The Monkees were the, uh, you know, the Beatles were the inspiration for the, the Monkees, Monkeys, which were right. and one could make the case were the were re- truly the first boy band, who then, as I said, you know, became, as we know, a real force in sixties and. T- continues to be in popular culture. I mean, they they're still doing it, you know. Right, and and what and the. The um, you know, the tragedy is that Rolling Stone, in their with their silly, you know, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, does not recognize the Monkees as a real group, and I think that's really sad because they, you know, like every other band, number one used backup musicians, mm-hmm. and I mean, I I've been listening recently to some of the the Beach Boys Good Vibration sessions. I mean, that was all backup bands except for Brian, right. Brian Wilson. And, and you know, um, but the monkeys... Well, the, the monkeys, monkeys will the monkeys, just never be cool enough for Jan Wenner. What can I say? You know? I guess I guess not. I mean, they had a, they had a, a British, you know, a British singer that, uh, you know, turned out to, that started in Broadway and, and turned out to be you know, one of the a, a really good vocalists. They had Mickey Dolans, who mm-hmm. was an actor, an actor in the beginning, who has yeah. who's done uh, some incredible vocals with the mm-hmm. Monkees. Yeah. Uh, they have Mike Nesmith, who was a, a, an exceptionally talented composer, and and still and made a a great uh, uh, career of solo music um, that he still performs. And there's mm-hmm. P- Peter Tork who t- kind of gets brushed over, but who was a musician in his own right, right. and, and add, added, you know, uh, a very strong element to the monkeys too. So well, the, yeah, yeah, sure. so, I mean, they, you know, there's no, you know, I don't want to dismiss, you know, give anybody the impression. And I don't think I have that I'm dismissing the monkeys because they are, you know, they are an exceptionally talented group. So. They are. And, you know, I'm thinking about how, you know, the idea that they, you know, they were truly synthetic and manufactured. I mean, they were. But I think it, so in that sense, of course, fitting the definition of boy band. But what's truly fascinating about it is that the cultural environment was so rich with talent that those guys who showed up for that ad of this, like, we're going to manufacture a band, each one possessed incredible talent. And that, I think, is why they were able to evolve as they did. Mm-hmm. You know, because, right. in other words, they were brought together to be pinups, basically, right? They were photogenic. They were all photogenic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To be pinups and Marx Brothers and Mod, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and then, lo and behold, they because of their personalities and their talent and their drive, you know, they, they, they evolve into a real, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, when you're talking about how talented each of them were, I mean, that's, yeah, you know, but it's getting back to getting back to the, they would, I wonder if the four, they would never have found each other had it not been for that cast. For that, yeah, right. But getting, getting back to the Beatles, you know, you have the, the four personalities there. And, and if you bring Pete in, to the equation and how 
see, there's another there's another element where you have to kind of, I think, look at, you know, a partial kind of boy band thing there. I don't know if that would if that what do you think of that as far as Pete goes? Because and the whole Pete episode, the fact that they oh, with the Pete. I, I was thinking monkeys. I thought you were talking about Peter Tor. OK, Pete no. Best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, well, I believe that they can, I think he just wasn't a fit on several levels. So I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking about. In other words, does that fit the fact that they were had boy band ish stuff? On, what would that what would in the future be called boy band stuff on their mind in canning him? Is that because what? if well, yeah, because, because <laughs> they he was, you know, he was the dark, moody guy. Yeah. And that would have been, you know, that would have been a personality that probably would have attracted girls. And, and apparently it did because he still has a big fan base in the UK. Um, he just so. wanted to fit for them socially. I think that they just, he wasn't of their tribe in a way. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, who knows? Um, but I mean, I think the way they did it was a little cowardly. Right. But the, but, but that, um, that gets that gets back to the whole you know, to some somewhat to the boy band thing a little bit. Um, but I mean, you have Ringo who was, you know, who um, endeared himself to the female to a, a who second was, who was conventionally unattractive by any measure, mm-hmm. right? Seriously, right? But yet he had. You know, in the heyday of Beatlemania, he had, I don't know, did he have the most or maybe Paul had the most and Ringo a close second of fans, right? I think, I think, I think probably it was a close second. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a sociologist, how do you, how do you justify that? Well, I can tell you from what I learned in researching Beatlemania, but also my own experience as a seven year old, when I had an opportunity to get those Remco dolls, I chose Ringo. You did. I Why did. was why was that? Ringo was my first favorite Beatle because he looked vulnerable. He was back there by himself, and the three of them in the front are having so much fun. And Ringo needed, you know, affection. Like Ringo was an underdog. He was left out of the club somehow. Um, I don't mm-hmm. know. Now, uh, and you know, some, some, I think the word underdog came up in interviews in the book too, but. I was very aware that he looked like he was being left out, right? Because if you think about those performances, like the three of them are really communicating. I mean, they're all communicating. Musicians do that. But Mm -hmm. the three of them are having eye contact. They're doing their famous beautiful little facial expressions and all this. Mm -hmm. And, like, he's up there kind of back, you know. I don't know. He just seemed like... There was something vulnerable about him. Outside of outside, that we all know what Paul brought to the table. What did George and what did John bring to the table in from your research um, in the book? You mean then, or looking back, or or looking, at, looking, the looking moment, back? Yeah, moment. looking back. Well, I mean, George was the you know quiet and mysterious. That you know, it's interesting. You know, they all had these sort of. Um, qualities you know emblazoned upon them as and there was a while where people saying oh it wasn't true it was all manufactured no these these things were true George was kind of quite a mysterious in the sense that he was the most spiritual he was the most um I mean he was a uh, he, he was a disgruntled spiritual person trying to find meaning in life. Well, and let's let's same, let's keep you know. let let's keep it keep it to the Beatlemania era, okay? okay. Not okay. not okay. to later. Well, I mean, I he was the quiet one. We didn't really know. I mean, he was the quiet one. You know, he had a quick sense of humor. They all did. He had, you know, George was the quick comeback, but he was kind mm-hmm. of quiet and mysterious. And then there was, and then uh, John. You know, John brought the, the mischief and the weirdness and also kind of, you know, uh, humor that kind of broadens your mind, you know, kind of makes you think the word play, you know, this type of thing. Oh, George did, was big with some work. George was all, well, they all were word play. I mean, they were clever. You know, that was part of the appeal, the, the banter between them. Like when it, you hear, mm-hmm. Even today when we, you know, I think part of the um, appeal of these releases and 
found tapes and all these things is hearing the banter, you know, the sort of like candid camera, like you're a fly on the wall and you're hearing mm -hmm. how these four guys banter with, with one another. And there was always something really wonderful about that, you know, because it was like we were seeing them in a private moment, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and just getting to Paul, I, I, um, I did a, a story many, many uh, years ago for back when Beatles Examiner was on examiner.com about how Paul was the, you know, was still adored by women mm -hmm. now. And, and, you know, that element, as I mentioned, you know, the way he, the way he, um, um, you know, wiggle, you know, did a, a wiggle on stage, you know, to get, you know, which provoked incredible screams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he knows, you know, the way that he knows that the Beatles attracted that kind of attention. And he, you know, he didn't, he seemed to hate it, although I think he's a little more mature about it now. I, if, that's a bad I word. But, they, you know, with the possible exception, I mean, I think they were all ambivalent about fame. I would say George was the least ambivalent. I think he really didn't like it. But I think all the others were rather ambivalent about it. And I think Paul mostly loved it. You know, he skewed towards loving it. You know, he still <laughs> likes it. I think he likes it. You know, he, but but Paul, you know, he likes bringing people joy. And he knows he does that. that was the, I wrote it when Egypt Station came out. And I wrote a review of that. And I think I referred to him as like Sir Joy Spreader or something. You know, because mm -hmm. like that's what he is. And he knows it. And it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think we've I think we've covered this subject <laughs> intensely. I think very, we have very intensely. Thank you very much, Candy. For, well, thank for, you. This for, was a lot of fun, as always. And we're back, looking back in history, and we have a long list of highlights this week. On June fourth, nineteen forty-two, Capitol Records was formed. On June 4, 1964, the Beatles replaced an ill Ringo temporarily with drummer Jim, Jimmy Nickel. On June 4, 1967, the Monkees won an Emmy for Outstanding Comedy Series. And also on June 1, 1967, Paul McCartney and George Harrison attended a concert by the Jimi Hendrix Experience at the Seville Theatre in London. This was the show when Hendrix began the set with the newly released song Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And opening that show was Denny Lane and his electric string band. So I've dug into the archives for a part of this interview I did with Denny Lane last year. The interview was about the Wings remasters, but he mentioned how that Jimi Hendrix show helped bring him and Paul together and led to the formation of Winx. Here's a, a little bit of that conversation. Working with Paul was because I knew him. It was very easy. It just was a very... We both grew up in the same music. Uh, we already knew each other, as I say. There was no, you know, having to get to know someone involved. And uh, I think that's why he asked me. I'm sure that's why he asked me, because he knew me. And he wanted to do that. He didn't want to have someone that, like, was going to be in awe of him and say, oh, I'm working with the people, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was that aspect to it. And it was very, very simple, because we we both had the same ambition to do something different. You know, I'd been doing my string band thing, and, and Paul and Peter Asher were in the audience at the Savile Theatre for that. It was the Jimi Hendrix show. and And they... He saw me doing something different, I think, and that's probably what inspired him as well to ask me, because, again, he had to do something different after the Beatles. There's no way I could do the same thing after the Moody Blues. And we, so we wanted to do something completely different. And that's where Wings became, you know, an all-original song uh, band, really. Mm -hmm. So there you go. On June 5th, 1962, the Beatles auditioned for George Martin. On June 6, 1962, the Beatles entered Abbey Road Studios for the first time with drummer Pete Beston recorded four songs, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, Based on My Mucho, and Ask Me Why. On June 6, 1986, Decca Records A&R head Dick Rowe died from diabetes at the age of 61. 
Rowe was the man who infamously turned down the Beatles after their DECA audition, but he later signed the Rolling Stones on George Harrison's strong recommendation. On June 8, 1967, Brian Jones played alto sax on You Know My Name, Look Up the Number, and on June 10, 1961, the Beatles, Paul, John, George, and Pete, signed a one-year record deal with Bert Kempfert in Germany. Some of the albums in history released this week on June 3, 1969, Elton John's Empty Sky, on June 3, 1972, Pink Floyd's Obscured by Clouds, on June 4, 1991, Paul McCartney's Unplugged, on June 4, 2007, Paul McCartney's Memory Almost Full, on June 5, 1981, George Harrison's Somewhere in England, on June 5, 1989, Paul McCartney's Flowers in the Dirt, on June 8, 1970, Bob Dylan's Self-Portrait. On June 9, 1969, Bonzo Dog Band's Urban Spaceman, with the title song produced by Paul McCartney under the alias Apollo C. Vermouth. And here's what you can find streaming um, through the streaming services. Above Us Only Sky is on Netflix. That's about uh, John and Yoko. George Harrison, Living in the Material World, is on Netflix. Yellow Submarine is on Amazon Prime. The Beatles 1 is on Amazon Prime. Good Old Frida is on Hulu. A Hard Day's Night is on the Criterion Channel. The Beatles 8 Days a Week, The Touring Years, is on Hulu. Candy is on Tubi, that's T-U-B-I. And Caveman is on Voodoo, that's V-U-D-U. And that's it for now. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com. Thanks, Matt. Beatles and Rama, thanks, Pat. And also on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please join our Beatles News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world. And check out our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or your favorite people. And where you can also find links for both uh, Candy Leonard's Beatleness book and my ebook Meet a Monkey Davy Jones. And look for our next show and please subscribe. We'll be looking for you. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying, Be seeing you. that one market fab